Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar, Carbon in Context, the importance of building with wood, presented with content partners, Medite Smartply. Now introducing your chair for this event, Ruth Slavid. Hello, I'm delighted to be here. I think you're probably all here because you have at least an interest in building with wood and an appreciation of some of the things it can do. I certainly have, not least because for the last decade or so, I've been a judge on the Wood Awards and I have seen how much progress and innovation there's been. But if you're talking to clients and potential clients about the environmental advantages of using wood, then I think you actually need more than just a bit of hand waving. You obviously need hard facts and a real understanding. And that is why I think this is going to be such a really valuable webinar for everybody. We've got a great array of speakers. We're going to be hearing from Matt Kennedy from Arup, Daniel Doran from the Circular Ecology, um, Rody Ward from Medite Smartply, and Peter Smith from Roderick James Architects. I'll introduce our first speaker in a moment, but before I do, we will have a chance of questions both briefly after each presentation and then a discussion at the end. And this, all this is your opportunity to ask the questions that occur to you. So there is a question button on your screen. Do please send those questions in when they occur to you and we will look forward to seeing them and putting as many as possible to the speakers. So that's how it works. And now I'm just delighted to introduce our first speaker who is Dr. Matt Kennedy, Associate Director of Carbon and Climate at Arup. Matt. It's my pleasure to be presenting today. Um, my main focus will be on industrial best practice in terms of achieving net zero carbon. So a little introduction to myself. So I lead the um, climate change and carbon services for Arup Ireland. Um, in terms of that team, that team also connects with um, Arup across Europe, where I lead on the Europe um, Climate Services activities. My background in terms, so I've spent a lot of time working for government in terms of decarbonisation activities. I was the um, EU negotiator at the climate meeting within Paris, where we agreed um, the Paris Agreement. And um, I've worked significantly across Africa and Asia on decarbonisation and resilience. So in terms of the net zero and where we're, where, why we're striving for net zero, the IPCC came out with its, and that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, came out with a number of scenarios, but ultimately the business as usual scenario is moving us towards most likely a temperature goal of four degrees, while the Paris Agreement um, is looking towards uh, achieving no more than two degrees Celsius and actually maintaining within a boundary limit of 1.5 degrees. That's the net zero objective. And you can see that the businesses, there is a transition risk associated with not achieving that net zero. And that's the context in which um, the drive for net zero is in place. So sustainability and why would we adapt a sustainable approach? It's really about re-establishing this balance between the needs of our population and the capacity and the health of our planet. And it's really the population, it looks like will double in the lifetime from around um, uh, up to around 8 billion and is projected to reach 10 billion by 2050. And that will lead to more urbanization. It will lead to more consumption. It will lead to a challenge for finite resources and it will ultimately result in a biodiversity crisis. And that's the lens in which um, a sustainable approach uh, we, we would be recommending moving towards. The key drivers from sustainability, there is an economic pressure, of course, in terms of um, the price of materials and, and uh, getting competitiveness for industry and also being a responsible business. So that from an industry side, sustainability drivers are often around governance. Um, and it's also, also the view of an organization in terms of society and uh, how responsible it is. And then, of course, you're driving some environmental uh, um, actions around better air quality, 
greener um, infrastructure and ultimately what is the narrative at the moment, this reduction in terms of carbon emissions. So what should business be considering then? So there is a transition challenge for business. And then what we're looking to do is, is harness the power of design, data, and digital technologies to create a more sustainable built environment. And that's moving from a conventional approach in terms of business action to more greening and more sustainable actions. And ultimately the products, the services, the technologies that we deliver looking to uh, have more regenerative approaches in terms of design. And it really moving towards this sustainable, restorative and regenerative design process. Now there are challenges for business. Construction is responsible for roughly 50% of all virgin materials extracted and that 50% corresponds within waste as well. So that will have an impact. And organizations, companies are looking to um, balance the benefits and the impact. So of course, they're conscious of their carbon footprint. They're conscious of their environmental impact in terms of um, not only their own business, but a greater society. And they're trying to balance the and achieve more efficient resource use. Now, there are benefits in terms of competitiveness, first mover advantage, and achieving more technical performance in terms of um, the product offering the businesses have. So there's a number of practices and key principles that I would um, recommend. Ultimately, what we're looking to do is to look at six key principles um, that in terms of framing our design decisions and our priorities in terms of business. And this is really um, some of the things that, that AROP strives for. There's a climate change driver, there's an environmental driver, and there's a socioeconomic driver. And you can see that, of course, net zero is the guiding mission, the guiding vision of which we want to decarbonize and achieve a reduction in carbon emissions along the value chain. The how we do that relates to more circularity in terms of your materials and your products, a focus on not just what happens within your buildings in terms of manufacture, but also on things like water reduction of um, pollution and improvement of biodiversity. And then of course, the, the buzz term at the moment is resilience, resilience to avoid stranded assets, resilience in terms of improvement of your, your infrastructure, your supply chains, your engagement with your clients, and ultimately, um, for your employees and um, your surrounding environment, improvement in terms of health and well-being of the natural systems. So what are net zero and why should we transition? Really, the actions that I would adhere, that I would push really is that knowing that buildings and construction are responsible for a lot of emissions, maybe 40%, the operational emissions account for 28%, and that energy is being used to heat, cool, light buildings, and the embodied carbon emissions are responsible for around 11% in terms of materials and the construction processes throughout the whole building life cycle. So these are the areas that you want to target on, minimizing operational carbon, reducing embodied carbon, and ultimately reuse or repurpose your and utilize your existing building stock. So understanding the construction materials impact, as I mentioned, in terms of impact in materials extracted, and the impact in terms of the waste that's generated. And what you want to do is reduce the extraction, uh, reduce those impacts in terms of virgin materials that are extracted as, we, as the world become more, more urbanized. Life cycle assessment is the next step. So when I refer to embodied carbon, I mean the carbon dioxide that's emitted during the manufacture, the transport and the construction of the building materials together with the end of life emissions. And this is a large component in terms of embodied carbon. You can see from the graphic here that operational is only a, a, a small dimension of it. But when you look at embodied, you're looking at the construction and the transport manufacture, the extraction of the materials and the importance of recycling, demolition and, and, and refurbishment. You really want to think about the materials themselves, then how you deconstruct those materials, even at a time in deconstruct those products, even at a time of you generating them from the, the first instance. The circular economy, again, reducing 
the embodied carbon and adopting more circular economy principles within the designs. This idea of um, designing out the waste and designing out the pollution, that happens at the creation stages and you keep the products in use that relates to the end of life stage. So you want to really um, maximize the life of products and materials while you're also generating more, um, regenerating more natural systems and you're making circular construction the business as usual. So you can use circular economy to achieve many of the climate targets. And in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, you can see that a lot of them, that breakdown is coming in terms of energy and it's coming um, in terms of products and food, pretty much an equal split. But the circular economy principles and their action in terms of emissions, what you want to do is you want to eliminate the waste and pollution. You want to keep your products and materials in use and retain the energy embodied with them. And if, as I said, you want to regenerate these systems to sequester carbon within the soil and within your products. And one of the points from the European Green Deal announcement is that only 12% of the materials consumed in the EU come from recycled materials. So this is a real challenge, but it's also an opportunity to repurpose and reuse a lot of our existing materials. The final point in terms of this aspect of the deck relates to the, na the natural systems and respecting planetary boundaries, understanding that when we design products and materials that has an, an impact in terms of our natural environment and we have opportunities to restore that. Um, and that can come in the form of prioritizing water, but really preventing pollutants in air, land and water. And those pollutants can be come from backup diesel backup generators, or they can come from uh, refrigerants for cooling systems. These are the types of pollutants that we're looking for. And um, a large focus in terms of policy at the moment around the EU is on this target of net gain biodiversity, maximizing your biodiversity gain by incorporating landscape and ecology in terms of the, the early stages of your process. So how do we embed such principles around sustainability into our pro projects? You can see this is an example of a recent Dublin office development in terms of um, life cycle. And you can, see the, you can see the impact that we're having. What we're trying to do is to reduce on the left-hand side the carbon emissions are equivalent in terms of um, a building a built environment and reduce that the initial materials with being green and then you have that's in the lighter green on the left in the middle you have a material replacement which should be much slower and then you're uh, smaller and then you're ultimately over the trajectory of the operational carbon which is the blue line you're moving to an end of life in terms of materials and ultimately reducing the impact of the CO2 equivalents all through that um, op operational phase. But you can see at the very start, the embedded part is embodied part becomes significant from the outset. So the steps also, generally this idea of what you should refuse any unnecessary new construction. So this is, this is one of the steps. So early decisions and design and programs of a project, they yield an impact in terms of the phases. So you need to consider the, how, how clients reflect and what is the most efficient solution that can facilitate a circular development. So repurposing of materials and uh, recycling and um, redevelopment. Rethinking is, is the next point in terms of building utilization. So um, what you want to do is separate the functions into different buildings um, and utilize a building all through its, its uh, day. So from a, a 24 hours of, of the day, seven days a week and allocate the resources efficiently ensuring that you have more circularity in terms of um, your building utilization. The third point is when you're designing, you're designing for longevity. So maximizing the service life of the components and how you do that is you focus really on the design and that design sets the baseline in terms of what is required to maintain and what is necess a necessity for repair. So you reduce the number of gaps and joints and all these different types of systems. 
you increase the longevity of your glass facades. All of these different design components have a large impact. And then my final point here is what we're trying to do with an Arab is to drive change and push boundaries, but ultimately celebrate the success and adapting these kind of um, uh, these kind of aspects and principles that I outlined around sustainability will improve your business. It'll make it more competitive. It will align more to circularity principles and biodiversity policies that the EU are enshrining. And uh, you will, as a business, and you will achieve more kind of first mover advantage in this area, be seen as responsible business, identify and attract talent in terms of want to come who work for you based on the values that you have and the um, the strength of your products and your offering within the market. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. We've just got time for a couple of questions before we move on to the next speaker. And my first question here for you is, uh, you talk about the first mover advantage, and of course there's the moral imperative as well. Um, but I'm just wondering, how do you advise your design colleagues at Arup on how to tackle the issue of telling a client that they really don't need a building, potentially turning away lucrative work? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because there's a large focus at the moment on, on carbon and whether infrastructure is required at all. And I would maybe say, make the same argument around transport. The, nearly the first step around transport would be, do you need to make the journey at all? But in terms of car, in terms of building, of course, the economy and organizations wish to be competitive and expand. So maybe the, the natural solution is not to build. Um, uh, they, they find that very difficult, I guess. But, but the advice that, that we would give is that if you are to design and, and construct a building, you want to do it at a point where it has longevity. Um, and you want to apply certain principles within that longevity, and that's embedding sustainability within it. So not only the design and the location and it, how it accesses other buildings and other communities, but actually what purpose it serves for your business in terms of um, minimizing things like circularity, minimizing things like waste, uh, uh, and um, uh, generally improve, improving the circularity, I should say, in terms of the, the materials, the construction, and actually stripping out as much carbon as you can. The, the, the point around sustainability, I would say, is that it isn't just a carbon focus, because if you just focus on carbon, you won't get to net zero. You need to be considering all different aspects around, around the building. And the industry are be trying to be responsible by um, by showing their responsi responsiveness and the responsibility in terms of society, they gain competitive advantage, and that competitive advantage can be can be reflected in f as a first mover. But also, they attract people who want to work for them, and they attract mm -hmm. clients because of the values of that that business portrays. And sometimes those values are reflected in in terms of their approach to carbon. But it is wider than that. It is nature based solutions. It is having more resilience around all your infrastructure. Thanks. I'm going to ask you another question about carbon, though, I'm afraid. And I know it's quite a big question, but perhaps you can give us a short answer now and we can discuss it in more detail at the end. And that is, given our need to get CO2 emissions down rapidly, is there an argument for designing less durable buildings now that have lower embodied carbon? and effectively kicking the problem to a future generation that might have cleverer solutions? Yeah, my answer is the opposite to that. So um, <laughs> it, is, it is designing for a future world. And that's why climate modeling and climate impact assessment become really important. Because when you're designing now, you want to design for longevity, you want to design um, infrastructure that considers future temperature worlds, and they may not be a two degree world, that might be a four degree world and a six degree world. So from a designer's perspective, we're very conscious that um, of the robustness of our offering in terms of changing climate and changing climatic forces and how they impact on future infrastructure. And whether that is uh, land subsidence or whether it is the impact of, of natural disasters or um, climatic uh, extreme climatic events, all of these things need to be considered. So having 
a robust offering in terms of design. So you're designing for the future. Kicking carbon down the road then comes with an economic price. So um, my sense would be that that carbon is increasing, um, carbon taxation, certainly in the, in, from an Irish market perspective, is going to be 100, 100 euro in 2030 per tonne of CO2. So you may be kicking, if you take a short-termism approach, you're kicking carbon down the road, but you're also kicking the economic opportunity is being lost by kicking it down. And then you will be burnt in terms of a higher carbon price in say 2030 by designing buildings that are not robust or designing um, infrastructure that um, is short term. And that's a real, that's a real challenge. Um, it also means between now and then you're actually potentially losing customers because what you um, present as your market offering totally reflects the values of your company and reflects your share price. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, we will have a chance to talk to you later again. Um, but now we are going to move on to our next speaker. Um, just before we do, I would just remind everyone, do please send your questions in. And my advice is send them in as they occur to you because otherwise you'll find they, you will forget them. Anyway, we're moving on now to our second speaker, who is Daniel Duran, who is Principal Consultant with Circular Ecology. Daniel. Thank you. So timber and embodied carbon. So first of all, we need to really understand what is embodied carbon. Uh, embodied carbon is the whole life um, of all the impacts across the whole life of a construction product or a project. Um, and it's conveniently broken down in the standards and these terms will be uh, perhaps quite familiar to many of you, broken down into several stages, the product stage, construction process stage, use stage and end of life. And the, the sum of all of the carbon impacts from those stages is the whole life embodied carbon impact. So your product stage is the emissions, the carbon emissions that come from um, extracting the raw materials, transporting throughout the supply chain, manufacturing, uh, and the sum of all of those is called, uh, often called the cradle to gate impacts for a particular product. Then you have the construction process stage. And this is really the transport from the place of manufacture to the construction site, plus the uh, impacts that occur during the installation, such as site energy, um, site waste and that kind of thing. And the sum of the product stage and the construction process stage is often called cradle to site or sometimes capital carbon or upfront carbon. So that's all of the carbon emissions that have occurred from the beginning of the supply chain summed all the way up to the point where the building is finished. Then you have the point where the building's being used and obviously during this, this stage you have maintenance, you have repair, replacement of products, replacement particularly important because it, it has the effect of multiplying the impact of particular products. Some buildings have plans to have refurbishments at some point during the life cycle. And then lastly, when the building comes to the end of its life, it's clearly deconstructed and um, you know demolished and the, and the waste is transported away from sites, it's processed, may go to recycling, may uh, just be disposed of. And so the sum of all of that is, is a is the whole life impact of a of product, or if it's lots of products together in a building, the building. So why would we consider embodied carbon? Well, the uh, globally, um, the construction and uh, building sectors responsible for a very significant proportion of carbon dioxide emissions. And of that, a uh, significant proportion is due to the manufacturing of materials, particularly things like steel, cement and glass. Uh, unfortunately, the latest data shows that although um, improvements are being made on a sort of project by project, building by building level, emissions are increasing for this sector because of uh, growth globally. So there's there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, so on a project basis, um, reasons to consider embodied carbon are, you know, that it, it can often on, on newer buildings match or exceed operational carbon across the whole life cycle. It can't be tackled uh, later on, unlike operational, where you could increase insulation or you could um, change some of the kit and the emissions have happened, it's too late. So it's something that really has to be considered right at the beginning. It's uh, a requirement now in, in uh, for um, things like 
the GLA requirements where, where it's entering regulation. So they're asking for embodied carbon to be considered across the life cycle and, and that reporting to be done and then the project to consider embodied carbon. The if you're looking at going for net zero carbon, then embodied carbon is for a project. Embodied carbon is something that needs to be minimised, uh, and then any residual carbon has to be uh, offset. So it's it's needed. So it needs to be assessed for that to happen. And then lastly, the process that's needed for embodied carbon to be assessed, which is a uh, in life cycle assessment of the building or the project, can also bring in. Um, uh, the emissions or the or the energy consumption rather from operational um, energy use such as heating and cooling uh, and even operational water as well so you can really bring you can bring that in and really get a good idea of the overall performance of the building and try to optimize those two sources when it comes to assessing buildings uh, you, there's plenty of information and data that's required uh, for example you, you need to know the products that are being installed obviously and the and the quantities that are being installed and that's uh, something you can gather from drawings or specifications preferably bim though because it can really help to speed things up because you can automatically take off quantities Quite often, though, bills of quantities happen to be used. Um, unfortunately, this can mean it's a bit too late in the process to make very influential changes after the assessment, because by the time that's produced, it's, it's, it's too far through the programme. Um, other data that's, that's useful, site waste and energy, that can be based on default data, at the beginning of assessments, at the beginning of the process, but uh, towards the end of the project, that kind of data is available from the principal contractor can really help to make the results more accurate. The um, default data that is provided in bills LCA tools can really speed things up so that you know this you don't have to um, always find out exactly what the number of replacements will be for particular products although that can help to make results more accurate but that kind of default data is there to uh, to make the process as, as streamlined as possible. Also end of life scenarios for different types of products based on current practice is something that's that's built into these tools too. As mentioned in the previous slide, uh, having energy, operational energy, consumption, data and water is, is useful that can be brought into and that can come from energy modelling software, for example. So in terms of products, well, um, the, the data that, that you need for, for products is, is, is available on something called an environmental product declaration. These uh, tend to communicate the uh, the rate of, of different types of environmental impacts, in, including carbon. Uh, for example, they might say something like there's 100 kilograms of CO2 per one tonne of, of the product. They can cover a wide range of pr uh, products they, you know, across the whole sector, like an average for a particular product category or sometimes and quite often they can cover very specific uh, particular products from manufacturers. Uh, that means that you can get hold of them from manufacturers like off of their website or the EPD program operator who, who've uh, logged the EPD. Um, but they're also available generally in EPD tools, uh, which, you know, try and keep their library of EPDs up to date. And so then you have to go through looking for them, which is makes things a bit quicker. In Europe, the EPD should be compliant with 15804, which is the standard that governs how EPD should be produced. That's something to look out for. And as we have an example there of a, of a MEDI EPD um, and some of this kind of a, a snapshot of a corner of the, of the data table um, showing the life cycle stages that we looked at earlier on, plus the three carbon um it, categories listed there there are lots of other indicators too that you can you can get from an EPD for different environmental issues things to bear in mind about EPDs is it's not really sufficient just to say oh I've asked for an EPD therefore I've reduced impacts they're purely data the product could be good or bad and that data is needs to be used in the building LCA and that's the thing to bear in mind about EPDs so in terms of the, the calculations, uh, this is this is a kind of simplified example just for one one product. Um, it's there's there's more to it than this. It just gives a rough idea. So you've got the kind of the, the data from the EPD, for example, in the green cells there. Then you have which is the rate of impact. Then you have the quantity in the building that you may have got from the 
drawings or from the bill of quantities and that's multiplied totaled up and that's your impact for the whole um, for the whole life if you've included the transport to site, site waste, replacements, end of life and that'll be for one product but that needs to be done for every single product so clearly it's quite a, a task to do uh, on, particularly on large projects so luckily there are building LCA tools that automate this as I've mentioned they contain hundreds of products that you can choose from they also contain many pre-made whole constructions of complete roof build-ups or complete wall build-ups which particularly at the beginning of projects around a concept design stage can make things much quicker than building up from individual products. They automate the calculations clearly and they many of them support integration with BIM uh, which is a very, much quicker way of, of tackling this rather than keying in lots of quantities and importantly the many of the tools will um, will support adherence to LCA standards so that the results are comparable um, and are, are accurate as accurate as they can be so that's a, that's something that that really does help when you when a, when a good quality tool is used so a particular uh, you know consideration for, for timber when it comes to embodied carbon is is biogenic or sequestered carbon it's often mentioned and it's a really biogenic carbon refers to the carbon that's within a biomaterial like timber and that carbon has been absorbed from the atmosphere um, over the while the, the plant or the tree has been growing from atmospheric carbon dioxide and that carbon is said to be locked up or sequestered in the product um, and it's locked up and it stays there and it doesn't re-enter the atmosphere and it's taken out of the atmosphere for as long as that product avoids being incinerated or, decom or decomposes so you know in a, in a if it's at the end of life if it's disposed of it typically the carbon will be re-released and we'll look at that in a, in a, in a few moments. Um, LCA standards do recognize uh, biogenic and sequestered carbon um, as long as the source of the, of the material is sustainable which means that the well part of it is that the trees will regrow or the plants will regrow uh, and so that's an important factor to make sure that the material is sustainable. The way that it's handled in the standards is that it's, re it's reported as a minus CO2 value uh, which is you know termed as a benefit at the product um, and the construction stage so stage A of the stages we looked at earlier on so it's it's shown as a benefit at the beginning of the life cycle and to give you some examples of the kinds of values we could be looking at here the green bars there show uh, the you know the the uh, the biogenic carbons which is minus numbers and as you can see on the table there the blue bars are the embodied carbon so you can see that for many of these products um, apart from one actually all of them are going the net effect will be that it'll be a negative number in terms of that um, stage a results so that's that's what people um, often point out about timber is it has this this negative value on the, on the results however the um, the way that the carbon accounting works in the standards means that the same value that's shown as a, as a benefit at the beginning of the life cycle um, actually is, is put back in as a, as a, as a load, as a, as a disbenefit if you like, at the end of life in stage C. Uh, so this is because as I've mentioned the uh, products are typically incinerated um, for energy recovery or uh, they go into landfill and even if they're down cycled um, the, to avoid double counting the, the biogenic carbon benefits which would be transferred to the new life um, the same as if you use recycled products in in the life you're assessing and got the benefit of the biogenic carbon there it can't be it can't be maintained in in the life cycle that's being assessed because that would be you know it'd be occurring in two places then so that'd be double counting so no matter what the end of life scenario is the biogenic carbon is always um added back in to the, to the life cycle and therefore overall there's really no to the benefit to uh, it offers no benefit across the whole life cycle carbon assessment. Something to consider here is that the um, 
finite supply of bioproducts means that if a, a project decides it's a good idea to over specify lots of timber to perhaps offset impacts from from other materials that could well mean that other projects are forced to use higher impact materials because of the supply issues so it's not really a overall uh, a great decision to make that's something to look out for yeah so the takeaway point here is that biogenic carbon is is not really an alternative to reducing impacts in the in the first place uh, that's something you know that it's it's an important area it's something that, that's that's good to see in the results at the beginning of the life cycle but uh, the reducing impacts is, is the main aim so how's that done well uh, first of all you, it should some, be something that start is done right from the start measuring and minimizing carbon uh, that could be done through um, first of all looking at the building level can we reuse the building can we refurbish it instead of you know particularly knocking down the starting again because any kind of reusing products means first of all you don't have to use new products which have emissions and you can avoid the existing products being disposed of so it really does make a big difference uh, when it comes to doing construction works then material efficiency so minimizing the amount of material that's consumed just using the right amount of material for the for the function is a great way to reduce impacts um, and then you know if you if you can then reusing existing materials particularly if they're on the site but not necessarily is a, is a is an important way of reducing impacts they generally have low impacts than new materials do avoiding over design so whether that's just simply um, just detailing you know a beam or a, or a slab or something else which is uh, doesn't need to be as 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 um, you know is exceeding the strength requirement is exceeding the performance requirement is is over design that's going to consume more material but also it could be even something that's an architectural expression like cantilever you know often that's going to use more material is it something that's really necessary do we understand the carbon implications of doing that something to to look at on a project by project basis uh, resilient design so minimizing replacement so using the right products in the right place that, are the, that have a long service life so minimizing replacements which has the effect of doubling impacts and minimizing the need for repair as well these are important ways of reducing impacts the using lower carbon products is often something that people think of first although the other factors there are just as important and bioproducts do tend to be lower impact than other products so they are well worth considering as long as they're used in, in the right place and can serve the function that's needed and maximizing the design life so in particular of carbon we have this deadline of 2050 and so if we can design buildings that contain timber that's locking up carbon well past 2050 that does buy us time to really kind of try and achieve that target so it will help with achieving that target so designing for a long long service life of a, of a building is, is a great way of doing that and all of these considerations are really something that needs to be done by integrating building lca into the design price process right from the beginning this optimizes the design it puts carbon you know in, you know the carbon performance uh, results there on the table to be considered alongside everything else uh, but not only that it works as a robust basis for environmental claims um, and it tells you what you need to know about net zero carbon about minimizing impacts and how much residual carbon needs to be uh, offset we've talked about ways to improve carbon performance during the life cycle and this is about beyond life cycles this brings in lots of circular economy type uh, factors and again this is all about measuring from the beginning minimizing from the start of the project so considerations here about being flexible so the building has flexible functions it can be changed it can be adapted to suit different functions such as you see often see warehouses in that converted into residential apartments that kind of thing so design that's highly flexible is less likely to become obsolete as quickly designing the products themselves to be easily disassembled take apart using mechanical fixings avoiding bonding means that those products are going to have beyond the life cycle perhaps additional uses can be reused again uh, 
and that's going to be enhanced by avoiding inseparable composites unless the composite material is something that can be re reused in its entirety. Modular and common sizes means that the things will be more applicable to other projects. It's easier to sort of plan a project using those kinds of products. It avoids offsets. So that's something that, that's really going to help in, in terms of the future use. Standardizing and documenting the performance of the product, whether it's structural performance, fire performance, or environmental performance, uh, having that perhaps through a, a material passport or similar is a way that can really help people to understand what the product is, what's in there, what, what it can be used for down the line. And of course, avoiding hazardous ingredients is, is key because there are materials now that we can't reuse that are treated as hazardous waste. So that's something to think about too. So all of these factors, um, although not part of the life cycle, they can be shown separately in something called module D as a benefit beyond the life cycle. So uh, really important considerations uh, and, and can be included as part of the LCA results. So once again, all of this, all of this, um, this consi these considerations are really something that is done through integrating building LCA into the design process as early as possible. Um, in order to to make the right decisions throughout that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that was fascinating and I certainly learned a lot. Uh, we have just got time for a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, you've explained very effectively that the benefits and the sequestered carbon in timber have to be repaid at the end of life, uh, rather like a mortgage. Um, but there are still strong environmental arguments for using timber, aren't there? Uh, yeah, I mean, all products have to be considered in the round and, and that's best done using uh, building life cycle assessment. But it's true to say that timber and other byproducts do have generally lower embodied carbon emissions in the first place. So setting aside the, the, uh, the biogenic carbon issue, they do tend to emit less carbon than perhaps other other choices, but as I say, the emphasis really is you can't pick individual product types or categories and say just use that. There are lots of other issues that have to be looked at, and that and so yeah, looking at it in the rounds, the solution and using building life cycle assessment tools is is a great way of doing that. And the other question is to do with um, the performance of buildings and the fact that a lot of the materials that uh, we currently use to improve the performance in terms of air tightness and in terms of insulation are relatively short lived and not always very easy to recycle. So how do we reconcile this with the desire to design for durability and ease of disassembly? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's these are important things to think about if there are alternative products that can be used that have longer service lives, um, then that's that's something that could be looked at. If a product doesn't have a particularly good service life and has to be replaced um, relatively soon, then that would be picked up in a life cycle assessment because all of the replacements of the product over the, the study period, the, the life design life of the building would would come up in the results. So you would you would you would have visibility of that. Um, and if you were broadening the um, life cycle assessment beyond just carbon, then you would also have. Um, lots of other results about other uh, environmental impacts, you know, to do with um, toxicity or resource use or lots of other things. Uh, the challenge there, of course, is being able to weigh up all that, that that kind of data results you get for lots of different environmental indicators and, and, and try and see what the best overall decision is. But um, yeah, when you stick with just one indicator like carbon, that, that task is a little bit easier. And now I am delighted to introduce Roly Ward, who is National Account Manager Frameworks at Medite Smartply. Roly. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today. Uh, I'm going to explore building with wood. You know, what are the immediate construction benefits and long-term health and well-being gains? Uh, what are the key, key processes that we need to incorporate to ensure a sustainable supply chain? I work for Medite Smartply. Uh, I'm the National Account Manager for Frameworks, uh, responsible for managing our supply chain and framework agreements with, with national house builders, two of our main contractors and, and modular companies. Uh, I've been specifying products in the construction industry for, for 17 years now, 
uh, across sectors which have included flooring, water management systems, interior fit out, and off-site construction. In terms of the contents for today, uh, I'll give you an overview of, of Medlite Smartply and, and who we are. Uh, we'll look at our process from, from cradle to factory gate, our engineered wood panel products and the embodied carbon that is measured. Uh, we'll then move to product specification beyond the factory gate and review the considerations to products once they have left the factory, uh, focusing on specification and the balance that needs to be uh, achieved when, when meeting industry challenges and, and, and standards. And we'll finish by looking at the targets, measurements and key areas of focus uh, for our contribution to, to reducing climate change. So who are Medite Smartply? We're part of the, the Quilcher Group, which is a, an Irish state-owned commercial company, and we're operating in forestry, land-based businesses, renewable energy, uh, and the manufacturing of, of wood-based panel products. Uh, Quilcher, the group, owned 442,000 hectares of FSC and PEFC certified forest, which is approximately 7% of the land mass of, of, of Ireland. As part of the culture group, we, we really pride ourselves on our, on our very own sustainable supply chain and manufacturing processes. Our products are, environment, are as environmentally conscious uh, in their makeup as they, as they are in their application. And we have two plants, uh, one which is in Clonmel in Ireland, and this is our, our Medite plant. And for the past 30 years, we've, we've produced a, a medium density fiberboard or, or MDF, as is, is also known in a wide range of standard and speciality grades, you know, such as uh, moisture resistant, flame retardant and, and zero added formaldehyde panels. Uh, MDF itself is, is a smooth, consistent fiber board. Uh, it's exceptionally well suited to, to, to machining, grooving and cutting to any size uh, with very little waste and, and it finishes you know, exceptionally well. A typical applications for MDF would be kitchens, bedrooms, bathrooms, uh, wall linings and bespoke furniture, and usually in combination with either performance paints, natural veneers or, or laminates. The Melite plant processes waste from the, from the Irish sawmill uh, in the form of wood chips, you know, and this accounts for approximately 60% of the raw material input for, for Melite MDF. MDF. Uh, and this fulfills a really important part of the recycling element for the forestry sector. Our other plant, Smart Ply plant, manufactures oriented strand board or, or OSB as, as we know it. And this is based in, in Waterford in Ireland. And it, it's adjacent to a, a deep water port, which significantly contributes to our low carbon footprint. You know, we're transporting products to, to the UK. Waterford is a, a state of the art facility that has received significant investment over the last few years. But shortly over the, over the coming months, we'll, we'll complete a capital investment programme, which will, will see an extra 20 to 25% capacity from the second half of 2022. Smart ply panels uh, are designed and manufactured for a variety of, of structural and non-structural applications. Um, every smart ply product is produced with, with no added formal, formaldehyde as standard. So, you know, this effectively means that the panels emit no more VOCs than a, than a natural plank of wood. So let's look at our manufacturing process uh, from cradle to factory gate. As mentioned earlier, you know, wood is a carbon negative material. 50% of the dry weight of wood is carbon. During the manufacturing progress, process, carbon remains locked up in, in all of our engineered wood panels. The primary component of metal MDF and, and smart ply OSB products is, is wood, which as it grows sequesters atmospheric CO2. We're able to measure the annual carbon storage of our products and this calculation based on a, a production of 800,000 meters cubed of material across our two factories a year. And this equates to, to 575,000 tons of total carbon, which is, which is stored each year. OSB itself uses far less energy and resources to make than, than, than other alternative building materials. So over 75% of the energy we use in the manufacturing process comes from wood residues and recovered wood. Burning wood byproducts as an energy source instead of fossil fuels increases the CO2 benefits still further. So that the total carbon is negative. The more carbon is locked up in OSB than, than is burnt during the, during the production process. And only natural materials like wood can, can, can be negative. Alternative you know, materials used in construction have a, have a plus magnitude of embodied carbon compared to, compared to wood. 
So beyond the factory gate, there is a responsibility you know, within the supply chain when specifying products in particular. Forestry certification means that the environmental and social effects of a, of, of a wood producer's operations have been independently verified, but still less than 10% of our global forest area currently has appropriate certification. So FSC certification is, is internationally recognized and it gives assurance around the environmental and, and social responsible management of our, of our forests. Smartply has, has received the FSC's chain of custody uh, certification. So this covers not only the supply of raw materials, but, but also its manufacturing and distribution, distribution process. And the chain of custody certification it provides a guarantee to, to customers that the, the product not only comes from a well-managed forest, but it, but it has passed through a secure, environmentally friendly channel and, and from its origin in the forest right through to the time that it's installed by, by the end user. And the project portfolio um, that we have uh, contains LEED, BRIAM, WELL, and HPI certified projects. Why, you know, why these certif certificates? Just quite simply, they're, they're industry leading tools and, and you know, inter internationally recognized, recognized standard. BRIAM recognized and reflects it, you know, the value in higher performing products and, and projects across the built, built environment. And LEED assesses the design and construction of a, a building based on performance and, and metrics. Well is the, the leading tool for, for advancing health and well-being in buildings. And the HPI, the Home Performance Index, is an Irish Building Council uh, certification. It provides a label of quality uh, for sustainable residential developments. And it also complements BRIAM and LEED certification really, really well. There are lots of factors to balance, uh, you know, certainly in terms of control and management when products are specified. So product application beyond the factory gate is, a, is another part of the challenge. And whilst we're able to control embodied carbon up to the factory gate is the work we do through early engagement with specifiers, architects and, and engineers at the front end of construction that, that allows us to be more involved in the decision making process for, for product, product choice. A specifier's toolkit needs to be balanced with certified products that are ethically, ethically sourced, that, that perform well. And we're always going to have challenges and, and trends in the industry, you know, past and present. You know, by that refer to things like the centralization of procurement that we've seen with main contractors over the last 10 years, the introduction of, of digitalization, the introduction of BIM, right through to some of the current issues that we're faced with, with the skills shortage, increase in the use of modular, modern methods of construction, the need for more housing and overlaid with the issues that we're seeing with, with, with energy. It, and in particular, these are all part of the same challenge that we're faced, in particular with the housing sector. Modern methods of construction create further demands, designing out waste, product weight, product thickness, wall and floor buildups, and the resource where those products come from and how they're transported. These are all things that need to be balanced. Uh, and that we that, that need to be balanced in order to, to, to achieve some of the sustainable standards. And let's not forget indoor air quality, health and well-being. You know, it's another key area of focus. You know, wood, using wood products with low or non-detectable levels of formaldehyde should be should be considered. But it, but in all of this, there's no need to compromise on quality with product choice to meet any of the sustainable standards. In terms of embodied carbon measurement and identifying areas for reduction, we have the environmental product declarations or EPDs, and these have already been mentioned uh, today. For Medite Smart Plying, these are a standardized way of providing data about the product impacts, about, about the environmental impacts of our products through the product life cycle. So all EPDs are independently verified. In Europe, they must conform to the EN 15804 standard. They're completely voluntary and provide a level of transparency and, and, and credibility, which, which eliminates greenwashing. EPDs are, are, are certainly leading the way for building level embodied carbon to be, to be measured. Let's look at our targets and contribution. The transition to net zero manufacturing is, is happening. The focus on sustainable sourcing and the decarbonisation of buildings is becoming ever more and more important as climate climate action rises to the top of the, the global agenda. Um, buildings are, are responsible for 40% of energy related to, to, to global carbon emissions and, and the World Green Building Council aims for all new buildings and renovations to have at least 40% less embodied carbon by 2030 uh, and to have net zero embodied carbon by, by 2050. 
will only be able to achieve this with, with certified low energy building standards like passive, passive house. But, but you know, these are going to need to be implemented you know, further to achieve, achieve the targets. We need to work with our customers to achieve net zero in line with the government targets and ultimately supporting the goal to become net zero carbon by 2050 and achieve the 2030 country targets. A great example of this is the COP26 house, which Peter Smith will be, be talking about following this presentation, and I won't steal any of his thunder. Medite Med -like Smart Ply played a crucial role in the supply of spe specialist products for this, this outstanding you know, project. Uh, the COP26 house is a, is a net zero uh, timber frame building, which is built by, by zero, beyond zero homes. Uh, and the product, product itself showcases low carbon circular solutions in a, in a building and living environment, which will be at the 2021 UN Climate Change Conference, which is in Glasgow. In terms of defining our areas of focus, greenhouse gas emissions are, are categorized into three groups or scopes. Uh, by the most widely international account, user accounting tool, uh, which is the Greenhouse Gas uh, Protocol. So scope one covers direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. Scope two uh, covers indirect emissions from the, the generation of purchased electricity, steam, heating and cooling consumed by the re reporting company. And, and, and scope three includes all other indirect emissions that occur in a company's value chain. This ultimately you know, underpins how we determine which areas to focus our efforts on and becomes a guide for our baseline, which we must first you know, define to be able to measure our, our progress going forward. We have to balance the choice of MDF and OSB panels specified on projects with all of these factors, and, and this can be achieved without compromise. Industry challenges and targets with the demand to seek alternative solutions are, you know, are not new to the agenda. Product choice does not have to be made with a compromise of performance, certification or, or quality. We will continue to innovate and collaborate with our customers to achieve net carbon zero. Thank you for listening. Uh, we've just got a couple of questions here for you. Um, the first one is, how do you deal with particulate emissions from the timber waste that you burn for energy? I mean, we know that wood burning stoves are seen as an increasingly large problem. How does your approach differ? Okay, so so we use a, a biomass fuel technology, and there's, there's a, quite a big difference between that technology and and and, and wood burning, you know, stoves. So you know, uh, particular emissions are, are very different to to, to, to carbon emissions. Um, you know, in a wood burning stove, um, you know, they're, they're not they're not filtered so you know a lot of the smoke and emissions and particulates get get released into the to the atmosphere uh, and with biomass technology you know it's a lot more sophisticated and, and, and regulated as well you know most most importantly so um, biomass technology as well they, it operates at a much a much higher temperature yeah you know, so that, you know the calorific you know values you know really optimized and a lot of that ash content and, and cinders are, are, are minimized from 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 the exhaust of those of, of, of that air um, the other thing as well, I guess, is that, you know, that's, it's heavily regulated, you know, and our, and our license is renewed annually based on, on those regulations. You know, we're audited regularly by the, by the EPA um, and, and also a lot of the heat recovered, you know, from the exhaust in the dryers makes that, that biomass uh, technology system, you know, very, very efficient, uh, certainly compared to, to the wood burning stoves. That's really reassuring. Thank you very much. Um, and the other question is about how future generations will deal with your products at the end of their life yeah so um, per perhaps lean on some of the some of the challenges that, that that daniel's mentioned in you know in his his presentation regarding you know circularity but certainly you know reuse repurposing recycling you know that is that is the priority you know refreshing there's a lot of technology that's being developed you know looking at that that end of life you know particularly with 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 MDF recovery and the ultimate solution, I guess, is a um, you know a collaborative in industry approach approach that's needed. Um, you know, a lot of focus is on the the here and now and what we can affect it. You know, immediately. You know, and certainly things that I mentioned about con the control we've got up to factory gate. But beyond the factory gate, there are challenges. You know, particularly with with application, particularly with uh, products where you know coatings or laminates or different adhesives. Uh, veneers are applied so you know these are all things that are being looked at in a lot of detail at the moment there's a lot of technology that's being being developed to 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 address that 
Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you again uh, when we get to our final discussion. Um, but now we're going to move on to our fourth speaker, who is um, Peter Smith, who's an architect and passive house designer at Roderick James Architects. Over to you, Peter. Hello, and thanks for inviting me along today. I'm going to talk about our zero carbon house that we're building for COP with a brief bit of background information, some technical details about the house itself and an update on how things are progressing on site with just a few weeks to go to COP. So to set the tone with COP26 quite literally on our doorstep, I feel this is a once in a lifetime and possibly final chance for us to make a difference and help influence and shape the future for all of us. It really is a momentous occasion. The stakes couldn't be higher. I feel like we've been waiting for too long for other people to sort things out. It's time for us to step up and show the way. This is an opportunity and also a responsibility for us to lead by example, to stand up and be counted. But that's enough blah, blah, blah from me. Let's get on with it. So a bit of background information. As most of you will know, our buildings and our building industry contribute around a third of all carbon dioxide emissions in this country. At the same time, we need to be building 350,000 new homes per year to meet our current demands. It's worth uh, bearing in mind that we're busy demolishing thousands of homes every year at the same time, homes that were built in the 1960s and 70s. So we have to focus on our new homes, the ones that we're building now to make sure that they are low carbon, that they are built better, that they last longer, and importantly, that at the end of their lives, they can be easily dismantled and recycled. I feel that we can do this. Um, it's a, it's a, a big challenge, but uh, the, the way in, in my mind to achieve this is by building our new houses using natural materials, including timber. Um, a couple of other little bits of information that you may not have been aware of. It was certainly a surprise to me to learn that the UK is the second largest importer of timber in the world after China. Uh, we are spending more than £6 billion every year importing timber to this country. And I uh, think uh, you'll all agree, having seen what has happened in the last six months with our supply chains, that uh, we should be doing all we can to avoid uh, such high levels of import. If we look at our timber industry in this country, we can also see that the amount of uh, trees that we grow, the, the, the forest cover compared to our total land mass is very low compared to our neighbours. So in most of the European Union, the average uh, percentage of land cover by forest is around 40%. Up in Scandinavia, that is much higher at 70%. But in the UK, our cover is only around 13%. So clearly we could do a lot better. Last bit of background info is about us. Uh, Roderick James Architects uh, build predominantly timber frame houses uh, all over the UK for the last 20, 30 years. And BSW are one of the biggest sawmill companies in the UK. They've invested millions in the last couple of decades to produce uh, as much homegrown timber as possible. We've been working together to deliver affordable timber houses around the UK. So here are some examples of the houses that we've built, all using timber that is grown in this country that we can get off the shelf from local timber merchants, uh, mostly six C16, Sitka spruce, but also uh, Douglas fir and larch cladding. We've chosen the smallest of our kind of typical house types called the barn house to use as this showcase for COP26. So if we take the, the design of the barn house, it's, it's a kind of signature barn designed by Roderick James Architects. It has a, a nice uh, open plan 
double height kitchen dining living space in one half of the building. In the other half, there is a bedroom and a shower and a, a staircase up to a, a mezzanine studio home office um, that looks down onto the, the double height space at the front. So we took the, the, the barn design and uh, took it apart into its kind of constituent elements and looked at every single piece that made up that building to see how we can reduce the amount of embodied carbon. Um, we also designed it on a 1.2 meter grid so it could easily be built by two people, but also that it can easily be taken apart afterwards. So after COP, this house will be dismantled into the, the kind of 1.2 or 2.4 meter cassettes and taken up the road to Abbey Moor to be the first of a small development of 12 affordable houses up there. So then we went around uh, the country asking various uh, suppliers, uh, industry specialists, contractors and consultants to come on board with us and provide their, their products and their expertise uh, in order to, to build this house. Uh, luckily, most of them jumped at the chance. We're extremely grateful to uh, all of these companies. Uh, large and small, BSW, Robertsons, Medite, Stico and Nordan to um, Eco Merchant, Rainclear and Rotoblas, as well as um, consultants like David Narrow Associates, Circular Ecology and IES. All of them share our philosophy and interest in looking at ways to reduce our carbon footprints. So using the information that we got from these companies and also the RICS database, um, we've managed to pull together um, a, a set of data that shows how much carbon is emitted by this building and also how much carbon we can store in the fabric. We then took uh, that data and compared it to the recent RIBA 2030 climate challenge and uh, luckily for us, uh, the results are very favorable. Um, if you um, can see the, the, the figure on the left is um, the business as usual, uh, roughly uh, a, a building built to today's standards um, of, of this size would emit roughly 80 tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, the, the target for RIBA 2030 is half of that, and we have managed to reduce our embodied carbon to be less than the 2030 challenge. Now, um, another set of figures that um, we're only allowed to present at construction stage rather than the whole life cycle is um, at, the, at the point of practical completion for this house, we have only emitted 25 tonnes, but we've actually sequestered or stored over 50 tonnes of carbon. So we we're, we're, um, can effectively uh, class this building as a carbon storage facility. Now, in the spirit of full disclosure, um, the, there are two other aspects to the REBA 2030 challenge. One is the operational energy and the targets they have set for that are extremely low. They, they're probably lower than the passive house standard. Now, for us with this small building, it's extremely difficult, even with um, technologies such as uh, air source heat pump to reduce the amount of energy that we need, uh, we're still struggling to meet those targets. That is, I, I feel, in part due to the fact that this is a, a very small building. Um, the ratio of external envelope to internal usable floor area is, uh, is um, not at the level that we would need. So the larger the building, it, the easier it is. And if you've got a, a block of flats, for example, that makes it a lot more efficient in terms of external envelope to internal usable floor area. So there's a way to go uh, for us, but we're, we're working on it and we're, we're discussing with RIBA uh, different ways of, of meeting these targets. And they've given us 
examples of other buildings uh, to, to look at. The, the final part of the, the REBA 2030 challenge is uh, looking at water usage and how we can reduce our demands, um, rainwater harvesting, for example. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting process that we've been part of. I've learned a lot and uh, this is kind of why uh, I'm doing this presentation is just to share uh, what I've discovered along the route. So uh, moving on to the site itself, um, we've, we've chosen a, a site between Central Station and the COP26 Blue Zone where the, all the delegates will be meeting at the SECC. Um, there's a lot of other things happening uh, around us on that site. Um, it's been coordinated by New Practice and Glasgow City Council on behalf of Scottish Enterprise. And there are also other things going on around the city run by uh, Glasgow City Council again, also Wood for Good and uh, the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. So we're hoping to link up with these companies and events to help coordinate a kind of city-wide approach. And then finally, uh, uh, an update on where we are with the build process. So uh, we started on site at the beginning of September, uh, extremely tight time scale, but um, it's a small building um, and uh, it's been panelized. So has gone up extremely quickly. We were kind of wind and water tight within about three weeks, I think. We're now moving on to the internals and getting the, the cladding on. And uh, hopefully within a couple of weeks, uh, this uh, is what it will look like if all goes according to plan. Um, thanks a lot for listening. I look forward to discussing this some more. I hope to see some of you during COP, if you can either visit in person or via the Architecture Today webinars, which will be um, coming from the house itself. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Um, fascinating to see what's happening. Um, and just picking up on the hint you gave at the end, I am delighted to be able to report that Archit the Architecture Today team will be in residence at Peter's COP26 house in Glasgow between the 2nd and the 4th of November. So we'll be hosting a series of presentations and roundtable discussions about issues arising from COP26 and please do email cop26 at architecturetoday.co.uk if you'd like to get involved or if you'll be in Glasgow and want to see the house. Um, we've now got a little bit of time where I'm going to ask Peter a couple of questions and then we will, after that, we will call everybody back in and we will have our group discussion. So, um, first of all, you know, you said that this is based on your standard barn house design, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about the way that you've enhanced the environmental credentials? And will you be applying the lessons that you've learned to your other houses from now on? Yeah, thanks. Um, the the main thing I, I think is um, when, when we took the building apart and looked at the various component elements uh, we really drilled down into the, the data that we got um, from these um, 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 bits of, of uh, EPD information that we actually got from, from Daniel Doran. Uh, so, for example, with the concrete foundations, we, we looked at ways to reduce the carbon and obviously lots of people will know about using green concrete and, uh, and the whole concrete industry is uh, advancing very rapidly at the moment, but we actually looked at other alternatives as well, like um, using recycled concrete pad foundations, um, which which you can get all over the country uh, at the moment from, from demolition sites. So rather than making new concrete, we can take pieces of concrete that were made in the 1960s and, and cut them up and reuse them as pad foundations for smaller buildings like this one. So we spoke to our structural engineers about it and, and they even suggested that a building as small as this could quite happily 
depending on on the site conditions, uh, could even sit on on paving slabs. And one of the bigger concerns they had was about how to how to strap the building down to stop it uh, to stop it moving in the wind. So that kind of thing, um, the the detail of every single component, I think, was important, and it, and it revealed a lot that uh, I don't think people normally think about when they're constructing a building. It's been quite an eye-opening experience. Thank you. And I am just going to take you briefly back to the foundations um, because it was one of the things that occurred to me. Um, you're talking about innovating on the foundations in the final position of the building. But given that you're building a house which is not going to be in this position for very long, and obviously, um, for all the right environmental reasons, you are going to uh, take it apart and rebuild it uh, in Aviemore. But for the temporary position in Glasgow, what are you doing about foundations there? Because you certainly don't want anything permanent, do you? Exactly. So uh, luckily, uh, on on the site that we've chosen, there was already. It's it's obviously a, a city centre site. Um, it's it's effectively a, a brownfield site so that it, it's been used uh, several times before there have been different buildings on there and there was an existing concrete slab in there from the previous building so again we spoke to the engineers and um, for this temporary installation we were able to simply put down railway sleepers strap them to the ground and and then fix our building onto the railway sleepers so after the copy event, it will be quite easy just to unscrew the thing and uh, and take it apart and, and take it away up to Aviemore. And those railway sleepers will go off and be used somewhere else. That's exactly. fantastic. I, this is the point at which I'm going to ask all our other speakers to come back in. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions, not surprisingly. Is a low carbon cost short life building actually a greater carbon cost than a higher carbon cost long life building. So I'm going to put that to Daniel. Is there a balance to make in there? Um, yeah, there is. There is a balance. Um, and the only way to, to sort of find the answer there is to use um, a scientific approach, life cycle assessment, do the analysis, look at what the results are. Um, make changes, try out different options, uh, see see what the results are and do that iteratively until you have what seems to be the optimum solution. Um, there's rarely any kind of a single set of rules that you can apply in every single case. Different uh, built, uh, sites make differences too. The site constraints can make uh, big differences. The, the use of the building is, is very important and what the intentions are for it, how long is it meant to be a temporary building or yeah, is it a building that, that, that could have a longer life but for some reason has, has, has been designed in a way that means it would need lots of repairs and replacement of products um, too soon in, in its life. So all those things can be uh, modelled and looked at and analysed and changes made in order to get the optimum solution. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here which says in life cycle analysis, does the product, e.g. a building, not come after the construction phase when it's handed over? And I'm not sure that's quite the question that the person's asking, but I think one thing that I'm particularly interested in is how this correctly very scientific approach works with the design process. Now, I know we lost Matt a bit earlier. You're back here, aren't you? Yes, yes I you am. Are. I hope Great. you can hear me, yes. Um, and I wonder, because you're within Arup, how um, you see this working? Because obviously um, there's a concept design phase. And at that stage, I'm presuming that the designers have to have a feel of what they're going to get before they get to the point where they can actually start analysing everything very technically. I'm going to put that to you and then I'm going to put it to Peter um, because I think he may have a look into it. And obviously um, you've done this life cycle analysis with um, Daniel, Matt. 
Yeah, I think it's really about dividing the project into different phases and understanding really what the carbon um, input will be and how you can m minimize the carbon that are, is being applied. So, of course, we begin with drawings, we begin with concepts and and showing the impact of one scenario over another in terms of a bit of terms of the built environment. But, but ultimately, what you are trying to do, as, as a lot of the kind of analysis shows, is reduce as much as you can in terms of carbon, in um, not only in the embodied carbon um, as you are kind of going through the construction phase, but also at the end of life. So in many ways, what the designers are trying to do and best practice would be, you design it with the purpose that you are going to break it down again at the end of life you know so if you consider these types of concepts then then it it, it informs how you originally constructed how you what your um i suppose what's your appetite for carbon at the start and how you would try to minimize that use maximize the materials and have repurposing at the very front of your mind in terms of a design and that allows you to go through the full life cycle in terms of calculation costs and all these different things but ultimately you have a, a vision in your mind about how you can break down the building the product and uh, all the materials at the end of that cycle and very similar to the analogy of the the cop 26 house here where you are building it in, in a particular venue with the idea that you would be deconstructing it and repurposing it and that's the vision in terms of a design for every building thank you and i am going to come to peter now and i know that you had daniel do the life cycle analysis for you and i know that the cop 26 house is actually a variation on a design that you had already so perhaps that made it easier to um go in and start doing that work um, but what I'm interested in is when you're starting afresh, um, when you're beginning a design, how you manage to think about it, how you manage to think about the life cycle analysis before you've actually got enough information for somebody to do it. Yeah, I think there are uh, kind of almost guiding principles. You almost know intuitively, uh, for example, that uh, natural materials are going to have a, a, a more favourable result uh, than, than man-made materials. And especially, I think we all know, um, you know, kind of concrete and steel are, um, are, are quite carbon heavy. And, and so generally, the, the beauty of, of what we do at Roderick James Architects is uh, we, we design and build predominantly timber framed houses. Anyway, and, and so I had a bit of a, a head start uh, you know, in, in terms of what we do naturally. Um, but uh, there are also other things, I think, as well, like, for example, um, having done the, the Passive House Designer course, there are other things that you kind of know instinctively that that you can then measure, like the, the, the impact of orientation and location on the overall energy use of the building and the fabric first approach to to spend more money on the insulation um that kind of thing you know that that it's it's been an interesting process for me to to go through this uh life cycle assessment with with daniel to to find these kind of carbon hotspots and and actually quantify and and make you realize you know how many tons of carbon dioxide are emitted by uh, by each area of the building, you know the foundations, the the walls, the roof, and and also things like the the internal fittings, um, and how often they're recycled, how how easy you can replace them. It's um, it's it's complicated, but uh, but interesting. Could manufacturers size their products better to avoid waste? And I guess the other side of this is can people design more to standard modules so i'm going to put this to roly first because obviously you're making decisions about the size of elements that you're producing and you want i'm sure as little of your product to be thrown away as possible how do you deal with that 
Absolutely. So I guess the the, um, the immediate answer is, is early engagement. Uh, you know, products can be can be produced to to bespoke sizing, but actually, if there's early engagement in the design process, uh, you know, then then different sizes can be can be accommodated. You know, and we, we, we're going through a lot of this at the moment with with the kind of rise of modular. Different modern methods of construction, different styles of building. We mentioned earlier about wall and wall and floor buildups, you know, and we're seeing new uh, new combinations. So, um, uh, and we're recognising that through through early engagement and, and, and working as, as early in the design processes as, as possible. The EPD information for specific manufacturers' material is good, but are there any references? where the optimum EPD for generic materials is set out. Now, I know there are generic EPDs. Um, I don't know whether there are particularly for the products you're producing. And I know you've put a lot of effort into your EPDs, but are you have you got a base to compare them to? Um, we, we have a type three verified um, EPDs, you know, and, and as you mentioned earlier, the EPDs are you know, completely, um, completely voluntary. You know, they're not mandatory requirement, and we've just taken, you know, upon ourselves. We've had the EPDs for the 10, 10 years now, and and, and uh, it just gives credibility to the, to the information that we are we are putting out to the market. Eliminates it greenwashing, uh, and and it's, we're just making the most of our obligation um, to, to to give the most credible, you know, um, measurement that we can with those those products. Um, and, and credible messages that, that come with those as well. And the EPDs are, are the best way of best way of doing that. So yeah, type, type three verified um, uh, EPDs um, is the level that, that we have. I'm going to come to Daniel now. Do you feel that there need to be sort of baseline EPDs for individual manufacturers to aspire to? I think it's a very interesting question and it's um... It's also worth thinking about the fact that when buildings are designed, particularly early on in the early design stages, but sometimes right through to the construction stage, the exact product, manufacturer specific product is not specified. Um, it can be specified as a performance, you know, that it meets certain standards, a given board or a given roof tile, whatever it happens to be. Um, so picking a product with a given EPD and saying this is the impact and then basing a whole building LCA on that is not always going to, to actually be accurate because it could be those products are substituted later on or the, the products that um, you've chosen is, is not the one that you, know, you end up gets that's, that's, that's in, installed at the end of the day. So, um, so based on that, I would say that a generic um, LCA data is very important and um, there's there are sources for it like the ICE database is, is a source of of generic performance for uh, or performance for generic types of products uh, and then yeah like, then if if uh, a project does decide that it's going to pick a specific manufacturer's products and that's in the specification the contract is not going to substitute it and the performance on the EPD is shown to be better than the generic or uh, alternatives then then fine, you know, you can you can see the benefit of using that product then, and it would be reflecting reality. I just use this opportunity as a final reminder that we will be um, hosting this series of informal talks and discussions in partnership with uh, Medite Smartply about the issues arising from COP26. And again, you know, do please email us on the email address that I gave you earlier, which is COP26 at architecturetoday.co.uk um, if you would like to get involved and if you will be in Glasgow um, and want to talk to us about your approach to the climate emergency again uh, use that contact and um, we will respond so I think all that really is left for me to do now is to thank our speakers for such a fascinating presentation um, to thank everybody who has been watching, uh, whether you've been sending in questions or whether you've just been watching at home and getting a lot of food for thought. Um, this is obviously such an important issue. Um, and the more we know, the better off we'll be. Um, so thank you all on behalf of Architecture Today and thank you to Medi Smartply for making this possible. And I will look forward to seeing you again at another event fairly soon. Thank you.